Drew was a copywriter working within the context of a fast paced creative agency. His job was to receive detailed briefs from clients and then write according to their needs. When Drew spoke to me, he said he'd never spoken to a vicar before and uh, he didn't know anything about church really or the Christian faith other than what you can pick up from TV. And he said there was one question he was dying to ask. I thought, gosh, what on earth is this going to be? Go for it. I said to Drew, and he said to me, how do you decide what to say in sermons? How do you decide what to say in sermons? And Drew touched upon a question that I've been asking myself in a slightly different way, which is, why do I preach like this? Why do I preach like this? It's a question I, I'm exploring currently in my doctoral research and, and doing that, looking at the, the world of homiletics and seeing how important it is that we focus on the preacher in preaching as part of what goes on. We've seen that from Liz already today and, and others too. It, it means engaging with um, some feminist um, thinkers and also writers who have thought about what it is to speak as ourselves. So those who are working within testimonial homiletics, like Anna Carter Florence. Now, I'm, do, I'm doing this research as a practical theologian, and those who know me a bit will know that I talk quite a lot about my excitement about the fact that, that theology is, is practical and that practice is theological, and that discovering our theology in practice is exciting, exacting, and essential. Elaine Graham, um, who's kind of the face of practical theology in this country, has, has noted how within practical theology, what's happened is there's been a turn to the self where what we know theologically um, is often um, contextual and autobiographical. It's personal. It involves reflexivity, which is seeing yourself, seeing yourself. And so I'm, I'm doing this research where I'm trying to see myself, see myself. I'm trying to really drill into what happens in sermon preparation. And I used to glibly say, well, I can only speak for myself, but I'm now discovering I can barely speak for myself because <laughs> I don't really know what I'm doing half the time, but I'm beginning to discover something of what Heather Wharton has called the complexity and ambiguity of our religious selves. I'm exploring what I'm doing so that I might be able to answer that question, why do I preach like this? And so what I'm gonna share with you now is, is just just something that's, that's come out of that thinking, just a small portion of that project. I'm going to give some, some theological background, some homiletical background, an example, something that's inspired me, and, uh, and then draw that to a conclusion. And the title of this talk is Present to God. Present to God. <laughs> So let me nail my colours to the mast as I begin. I, I do identify with and want to join in with the likes of Will Willimon, who Calvin quoted earlier, who follows thinkers like Karl Barth in, in saying that preaching, first and foremost, is a theological act. It's something that we do um, because of who God is, that God is a God who speaks and God is God who speaks through Christ and is speaking through Christ. And uh, Willimon, um, rather famously said one time that at the heart of preaching is a God who speaks and who speaks now in the sermon, otherwise preaching is silly. I think he's right, except in my experience, preaching um, is silly, and yet somehow God speaks through it. And that's part of its, uh, its mystery and its majesty, its, its magnetism, that through this silliness and foolishness, as the other quote that Calvin used, as that, as that we offer that, still God can speak through it. In terms of what I'm discovering about my own theology of preaching, and I'm always drawn back to 2 Corinthians. That's the one book of the Bible where I want to make sense of who I am as a preacher, I, I end up returning. And those who have um, thumbed through this in my book will know that um, in 2 Corinthians, we, we explore that great image of the treasure in clay jars. I love that. I love that image about preaching as we are in our clayness, 
so that God's work is, is shown through that. Being ordinary clay preachers is an asset. As much as I like that image, that's not the standout um, idea or verse that, that's, that's really grabbed me. For me, that's in 2 Corinthians 2.17, where Paul writes, uh, for we are not peddlers of God's word like so many, but we speak in Christ as persons of sincerity, as persons sent from God and standing in his presence, 2 Corinthians 2, 17. I love the idea of sincerity, persons of sincerity. That means persons without pretense, people who are sincere without pretense. That verse, um, quite a literal translation of that verse from the Greek, reveals its beauty and depth and poetry. The second half of that verse reads like this. It says, um, as of God, before God, in Christ we speak. As of God, before God, in Christ we speak. Um, and and uh, that's really my vestry prayer when I, before I preach now. That's what I try and hold on to, to, to prepare myself for what it is we do. That we do something without pretense, as of God, before God, in Christ we speak. Now, all of those different parts, those, those three in that main phrase, I think are worth exploring. What it means to be of God is, is really crucial. And that's definitely come through today in other talks. What it means to speak in Christ is a striking idea from, from particularly Paul's letters about speaking as those who experience new, newness of life through baptism into Christ's death. And, uh, and that, that, that's probably worth a lot more thought and journaling and investigation. But the one I want to speak to is the middle one of the three, before God. As, yeah, God, as of God, before God, in Christ we speak, before God. And I'm speaking about before God because that's the title they gave me for today. And they shouldn't have given me that because I am no good at this. Being present to God is not my skill as a preacher. I didn't write that chapter in the book. I hope you realise. Liz wrote all of it. All of it. I didn't add a word because it's something I wrestle with. But I know that I wrestle with it because I also know it to be important. See, before God. Now, I'm quite happy with the idea that, that you know, God is, is present to you and to me and to all creation. But as sure as I know, that doesn't guarantee that I am present to God. In fact, I'm quite good at not being present to God. And as a preacher, um, I, I often avoid being fully present to God for as long as I can in the process, because I know that's the point at which it becomes vulnerable, at which I have to open my heart to God. So, you know, when I'm writing a talk with that kind of avoidance going on, you know, it's, it's less, here I am, Lord, send me. And it's more, here it is, Lord, take this. <laughs> but I do know that, that in that being the presence of God, and, and indeed wrestling with, with why I know and how I know that is crucial, that I can answer the question, why do I preach like this? The 1970s were a crucial decade for um, white Protestant Western homiletics. It was the time of the new homiletic building on the new hermeneutic, giving attention to what words create and affect, not just what concepts they convey. It was about exploring how the scriptures um, do something as well as say something. And in the same way, um, our sermons, it was important that they would do something, not just say something. Tom Long summarizes this beautifully by talking about the biblical language creating um, events to be experienced, not just thoughts to be learned and applied. Sermons were being rediscovered as events for hearers to experience the presence of God. And there's lots of really good things that, that come out of that movement and are still coming out of that movement. But as we touched upon briefly in, in, the, in the book launch, um, I think in the new homiletic, with this emphasis on how hearers experience talks, what happened is 
and the, the, what happened is the preachers process, their identity, their aims, and what's gone on behind the scenes gets rather marginalised. And, uh, and Margaret's gone now, but if I could have chatted with Margaret more on this, I would have done. Um, because because that, that, the role of the preacher is important. Now, I'm not knocking the new homiletic because it has inspired preachers who have inspired me, but there clearly are a number of issues with it. And one of them is the name, new homiletic. Um, because the, the preaching it, that it promoted wasn't new for everyone. As Joseph Evans has pointed out, it was something of a discovery within white homiletics of preaching uh, that, that they'd been exposed to through the civil rights movement. This might have been new for some people, this was not new for everyone. And there's another issue with the new homiletic, this emphasis on here is experience that John McClure talks about, which is how as focused as it claimed to be on here is experience, it didn't pay an awful lot of attention to hearers actual experiences. It appealed rather to common human experience rather than the diversity of human experiences. And so what we're seeing in, in, in homiletics in thinking about preaching that's come out and has been informed by the new homiletic is uh, attention given to those areas. And great to hear colleagues talk about ways in which um, that can be done. There are different ways of responding to that gap, that problem. And part of it is being present to context, present to congregation, present to culture. One of the other um, models that McClure identifies as, as dealing with this issue, um, and at least um, in, you know, taking the time to inquire before presuming to speak, is testimonial homiletics. Testimonial homiletics. And that's um, a branch of homiletics um, associated with Tom Long, um, uh, and, and a kind of Carter Florence um, and, and others. And this is where I, I find myself most comfortably locating my thought with this idea of preaching as testimony, with the preacher as a witness. And I like that, not just because I'm trying to dodge the, the difficult work of really listening to other people and their experiences and context, because I think we all agree that is absolutely vital. But I want that probably most because essentially I'm an itinerant preacher now. Um, working within a theological college, I do the bulk of my preaching um, across the, the a diocese when I'm asked to do cover. I go and preach in churches that I do not know. Sometimes I know very little about them before I go and even less after I've finished. <laughs> so I, that work internally is really crucial that at least take the time to, to hear and see what I'm doing. So testimonial homiletics um, it itself has different voices within it. And, uh, and within that, um, Patrick Johnson has written about um, some of the different perspectives, or not least on what is the object of witness. So we might agree that the preacher is meant to be a witness. What is the object of that witness? What are they witnessing to? And Johnson has highlighted that, that on, on kind of one end of the argument, you've got people like David Lewes, who has said that what the preacher is witnessing to is the gospel. And then on the other side, you've got um, Anna Carter Florence, and what the preacher is witnessing to is their encounter or experience with God or from God in the text. So as they're engaged in preparing for the sermon, that experience with God is what they're witnessing to. And then Tom Long, um, in quite an Anglican style, was nicely in the middle, um, saying uh, it's both, it's both the gospel and the experience within the text. What I think both Long and Carter Florence um, have captured, and they both draw on Paul Ricoeur, who's thinking, I think, underpins both of their work, is that, is that testimony, according to Ricoeur, is about not just outside attestation, not just about what you say, what you put out there, but also about inner conviction and faith. And it's about those two working together. So there must be something of, of what happens on the inside as well as what happens on the outside and if those two are working together in harmony, that is good and right testimony. So this is more than speaking the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. It's also about what you can say sincerely, that what you can own based on inner conviction and faith. And so this, this idea of, of being a witness, 
with this idea of being present to God kind of comes together in quite a significant way. Because at times when I prepare, I'm not preparing to be the right kind of witness. I'm preparing to be the kind of witness you'd get in a court that might be an expert witness or a character witness. Now they have a role to play in court. They have something to say, they have something to contribute. But most witnesses are not these. Most witnesses are lay witnesses. They are only there because they have seen or heard something. You have to have been there to be called as a witness. And if preaching happens before God and is about being present to God, as preachers, we need to have been there. We need to have been there. And that means in certain preparation, asking the, the, the direct questions, what do I think God is saying to me? And what is that doing to me? It says something, it does something. And I have to have been there to be present to God. And what do I think God is saying to me? And what is that doing to me? Let's um, explore an example. So um, during, during lockdown, um, preparing a talk on Monday, Thursday for a group of all the lands, um, who uh, were weeks away from being ordained, Anglican ordinance uh, just about to be ordained. I was preaching, as you'd expect, on John 13, the foot washing, it's Monday, Thursday. And, uh, and in preparing to preach, the preach generally, I was riffing on the motif of Jesus knowing, which is the key idea in John's gospel that kind of comes to a head in that passage about how Jesus knows. But as I prepared for the talk, one verse in particular just really smacked me between the eyes, uh, John 13, uh, verse 12. And it's, it's after he washed the disciples' feet, he put on his robe, returned to the table, and he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? Do you know what I have done to you? John 13, 12, that's the NRSV version. Now, I knew that I had to do something with that before God. You know, I had to, um, I loved how Margaret did that exploration uh, stuff first before the spiritual question. Um, I had to feel the weight of those words. I had to feel the weight of those words uh, behind the text with the Joe and I in community, with these people uh, at the time of John's gospel who were experiencing um, this, this change in identity being thrown out of the synagogues and all that was going on for them. I had to feel the weight of those words for them behind the text. I had to feel the weight of those words within the text for the disciples for whom Jesus has just ripped apart all their ideas of status and who they thought they were and who they thought he was. I had to feel the weight of those words for my hearers in front of the text whose minds are on their impending ordination. But most of all, I needed to hear the weight of those words for myself because they had connected with me, they then had to be a bridge through which I would connect with God and know myself to have been present to God. I'll come back to that in a minute. I just want to share with you just a, a short excerpt of that sermon. Do you know what I have done to you? Do you know what I have done to you? Not do you know what I have done for you? What Jesus does is not something that saves us a task or a job. What Jesus will do isn't just something he does for us. Being washed by Jesus is about more than dipping our toes in, more than getting our feet wet, more than bathing in reflected glory. It is about being those to whom Jesus has done something, and it has to. We know what life has done to us. We know what others have done to us. We know what we have done to ourselves. Those who are washed by Jesus 
hear him say, do you know what I have done to you? Those who gather around his table hear him say, do you know what I have done to you? And as the bishop lays their hands on your head for the office and work of a deacon in God's church, will you hear Jesus say, do you know what I have done to you? For, says Jesus, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. I couldn't have preached that sermon, particularly that those three phrases that build. We know what life has done to us. We know what others have done to us. We know what we have done to ourselves. <clears throat> Unless I have done the work of being present to God and know what I mean for me as I say them. Now, it was inappropriate to unpack what I mean to others in that context. That's a layer of self-disclosure that nobody wants at that point in time. But that self-disclosure had to happen between me and God. And this is part of what it is to be present to God. Thomas Keating, um, the, uh, the late uh, Cistercian monk and the great advocates of centering prayer, he, um, he talks about how um, God knows us through and through. But as we disclose, disclose ourselves to God, particularly when we disclose ourselves to God in our own words, we come to know ourselves. And through coming to know ourselves before God, we come to know more who God is. To preach before God requires me to be present to God. And of course, in that very passage and idea, what we see is how that challenges views of reality. Jesus breaks through um, a sense of reality to make the, the God who might otherwise seem distant, very, very present and up close, not far off doing something for us, but there, present to us, doing something to us. And that matters if I want to ask, why do I preach like this? I um, spend too much of my life watching uh, Netflix. So um, it's good to kind of try and justify that sometimes by pretending that that has some kind of, you know, worth to my current research. Um, I think it does, uh, and I'm telling myself that. And, and I, I, it's very easy to do that when you read um, good uh, current thinking about practice, um, like Alice McKenzie's making a scene in the pulpit, which relates to disciplines like TV and theater and film studies. And as preachers, I think there's loads we can learn from those other disciplines to inform what it is that we are doing. So Mackenzie's making a scene in the pulpit that others have mentioned. Uh, I love that, that idea of scenic preaching, it's narrative preaching, but for a world whose screens have got smaller while the Mount Lake costume on them has got larger and larger. Um, but it's an idea that, that's, that's in, that sort of develops in conversation with film and TV. Those who have uh, looked at uh, this in my, my book will know that I um, talk there about something within um, television and film that I think is useful to us as preachers. And that's the idea of breaking the fourth wall, which is sometimes called direct address. So you know what happens? Normally you watch a TV program and it all unfolds before you um, in its own storied world. And the actors do not acknowledge the presence of the camera because that does not exist in that world. Except sometimes they do. They, they break the fourth wall. They, um, they look down the camera and they address the audience. And that changes how the audience experiences the story. So um, I talk about Fleabag in the book, BBC comedy Fleabag. That's not a recommendation because you really might not like it. it depends on your level of humor. Um, but, um, if, <laughs> but, but that's an example from, from fairly recently. I grew up with these. I'm what they call a geriatric millennial. I, I have literally, I, it's true, I have literally six days left in my 30s and I'm going to milk them. Uh, but I grew up with, um, you know, uh, Clarissa explains it all, Saved by the Bell, um, these Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, these, these kind of dramas where it was normal for 
for the main character to take time to speak to you personally. Mm. And uh, I, think, I think that's there's something important going on there. Now, I think what's important in that is helping us to think about being present to our congregations. So I talk about how it's a way of having wonderful kind of narrative, but stepping outside of it to affect how people engage in it. I think that's, that's helpful. But I also think there's something in this that's useful to us when we think about what it is to be present to God. And, um, and this becomes clearer when you look at the, the background to how that technique was used in 20th century film. Now, it didn't, it's not a new phenomenon. It's, it's, it's something you'd see in Shakespeare's soliloquies, the idea of you know, addressing the audience. But it's interesting to me that this style of approach um, is something that people are more increasingly using to connect with people. So in, in the 20th century, um, film kind of settled in by the middle of the century into a pattern where, um, where, where the, the film take, would take place in a storied world, which is called its diegesis, and, um, and that would be completely sealed. That, that would just, it would happen there. You wouldn't acknowledge the camera. The actors would not break the golden rule um, of don't look at the camera. Uh, and what, uh, and so the, the breaking the seal of the digestive world um, wouldn't come until the 1970s with, um, in, in a meaningful way, with the advent of what was called uh, 1970s screen theory. So this is quite interesting. I'm drawing on the work of Tom Brown here. So just at the same time as we have the new homiletic, which is trying in its own way to free narrative from a framework to free story to speak for itself. In screen theory, something else is going on, looking at it from the other way, which is about saying that actually what's happening by having the diegesis, the story world separate from the viewer, is that it turns the viewers into voyeurs. They're just watching something that they don't have to acknowledge their participation in it. Mm -hmm. That this sets up an environment that seems hermetically sealed that objectifies women, that's what Laura Mulvey uh, was writing about. Um, and there's, there's something problematic about separating these views of reality as potentially unhelpful. It, it buys into what was called an, a, a, the hypnotic illusion. You don't break the hypnotic illusion of this is real by addressing the camera. And in the 70s screen theory, what, what was coming through is actually it's time to break the hypnotic illusion. And a lot of this was, was building on the work of Bertolt Brecht and what was he, he wrote about as anti-illusionism. So he, it literally was about breaking the illusion in theatre. Actors would show that they were acting and, and breaking the fourth wall, direct address, sometimes all this is called meta-reference. What it is doing is it's just pointing to where the boundary is between the fiction and reality so that you see it in a different light. It exposes, in Brecht's words, the forces at work behind the story. It makes ideology clearer. And I think, um, having just heard Calvin's powerful talk on racism, the idea of making ideology transparent and clearer definitely sounds to me as though it's something that, that we can grab hold of in our preaching far more. Now, here's the thing. When I think about what it is to be present to God as a preacher, I have a, a deeper and deeper conviction that with all the talk of seals and stories and worlds and illusions and scenes, that the greatest, um, the, the most significant boundary on, on reality is the one where we, we live in the hypnotic illusion that our world is real and God's reality is unseen. But that's where the boundary is, it's between what we think of as reality and what God sees as reality. Life without being present to God, acknowledging God, and life trying to see it from God's perspective. And our job as preachers, and this is not about content, you can teach great things, you can tell great stories, you can, you can do all kinds of things in your sermons, but if for preaching to, to be real, it needs to do something 
that exposes the illusion and the fiction that the world as we experience it without being present to God is the real world, because it isn't. The real world and reality is what we can know only before God, being present to God. The illusion is powerful. We think that you know God is hard to get to, and I'm back to Keaton here, but actually the opposite is true. You know, God's impossible to get away from. You know, as the psalmist says, you go to the, the, you know, the bottom of the sea, the end of the world, God is, God is there. And God is, is closer to us than we are to ourselves. And I've preached too many sermons where before I've, I've started preaching, I've prayed, may I speak in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, that's great, but I'm not just speaking in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm meant to be speaking in the presence of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The name and the presence of God, being present to God. So I'm wrestling with what it is to be present to God. But I'm starting to see that a key part of that is to do all I can to break the, the hypnotic illusion about what reality is or isn't. It's about recognizing where, where God is at work on those boundaries. It's about exposing the forces that are going on at work behind the stories that I want to tell. And bringing all of that to God in prayer. See, I, I do know what life has done to me, and I know what others have done to me, and I know what I've done to myself, but I am beginning to discover that what Jesus has done to me, he's shown me that there is a reality that is beyond my imagining, a God who is not distant, but who is real and who is present. And so, whether it's you or Drew or myself asking me the question, why do I preach like this? I can answer, I preach like this because I want to be present to God. Because being present to God is the only thing that makes preaching real and less silly. Because as of God, before God, in Christ, we speak. <laughs>